And what I've done uh, off screen here is complete the equity calculations for the banking sector versus the non-banking sector. We've already got the equity of the banking sector, that's B underscore E here, or B lower uh, subscript E, banking sector, which is defined by the original godly table up the top here. I've simply added together firms equity and capitalist equity with respect to the banks to give over capitalist overall equity, which is negative, added in workers' equity here, which is positive. Obviously, if workers were taking out loans to buy houses, they could be in negative equity as well. Add them together, and that is the equity of the non-bank sector of the economy. And by because of this, the law of accounting that assets minus liabilities equals equity for each ent uh, financial operation in the economy and for each entity in the economy, then the non-bank equity is in the sector must be a negative equity in a pure credit economy with respect to the banking sector and the overall equity of the economy is zero. So I'll just take a copy of that item and whack it over here. Uh, and if I then run the model and see what happens, what you find is that the banking sector is in negative equity and the um, non-banking sector is in, sorry, the banking sector is in positive equity and the non-bank sector is in negative equity. And it takes a while for the economy to settle down. It starts off with uh, uh, the banking sector being in positive equity of 10. It stabilizes at 12 given the value of parameters that I've used in this model. And notice the actually the non-banking sector is precisely the same magnitude and the opposite sign. The banking sector is in positive equity of 12. The non-banking sector is in negative equity of minus 12. And this number down here uh, is as close to zero as you can get in a simulation. That is uh, 162 by 10 to the minus 15. So to the decimal point, 15 zeros and 162. Okay, let's now change the rate of lending. Let's have lending happening more rapidly. What happens? Well, notice that the equity position of the banking sector improves and the equity sector of the non-banking sector deteriorates. Why would, therefore, the, the non-bank sector borrow from the banking sector in this situation? The outcome for income tells you because there's more money in the economy which has been created by banks lending more than they're getting back in repayments and that money is turning over at the same rate that I used initially, then you get an increase in economic activity. So the negative equity is a, a downer, uh, but the reason you borrow the money is because of rising incomes over time. But you cannot escape, if you have a, a pure credit economy, the, the Austrian fiction of a world in which bank government doesn't exist or is so trivial you can ignore it, pretty much the 19th century. Uh, compared to what it's like post the, post the Second World War and Great Depression, then inescapably the non-bank sector of that economy will be in negative equity. What I've done off screen is add in calculations for the debt ratio here. So I've got capitalist debt divided by GDP. I'm calling out the debt ratio of the non-government sector because what I'm going to do in the next video is bring in a government sector so I can actually the private sector debt versus the government sector debt. Now again, I'm doing a, a very simple model here, so I'm not I'm only having capitalists doing the borrowing. I could have firms borrowing and workers borrowing as well. Uh, it would just make the tables bigger and messier. The same basic point I made a moment ago that the non-banking non sector must be in negative equity relative to the banking sector would still apply. I just want to show one little trick here, and that is that as well as having variables and uh, parameters, we also have constants in Minsky, of course. And I'm going to bring in a constant with the value of 100, uh, which is always 100, can't be varied. That's going to be the, shown as a percentage. We'll add a percentage uh, block at a, at a later stage to the program. Now, if I just drag this down here, I'm multiplying the ratio uh, by the um, um, by 100, so I'm going to get the percents. Hit the uh, uh, recalculate key, so the debt ratio of the private sector in this model begins at 71.4% of GDP. And if I then do the same simulation as beforehand, uh, then it stabilises at a higher level because the um, amount of uh, GDP varies as the model runs, not the amount of um, uh, debt, but the amount of GDP here. And the income is running at uh, 88, so at the debt level of 100, GDP of 88, then the debt ratio is 111%, which 
not too far from the actual real world on that front. And if I now then say, well, let's have a, an increase in the rate of lending and a slowdown in how fast loans are repaid, then the debt ratio rises as a result of that. Uh, but also at the same time, you have rising incomes. So the rising debt ratio may be worth it because of a high level of income uh, going to the capitalists. Uh, so that's the, that's the basic idea here. Uh, you can vary the rate of lending and see what happens to the economy. If lending shows down and repayment speeds up, you will have a decline in the economy. And then we can go, let's say repayment slows down, lending accelerates, the economy will recover again. So this is one of the reasons that endogenous money is so important. Uh, it shows you that varying the rate of lending and the rate of repayments by the banking sector changes the amount of money in existence because lending creates money and that can also change the rate of economic activity. I could be varying other elements here. I could be varying how fast capitalists consume and workers consume and so on and so forth. But the basic point here, there's a relationship between the rate of lending and the rate of uh, economic activity.